So thank you all for coming. I want to compliment you on your great attendance, active listening, and concise statements and questions. And you are great, and I want to applaud all of you. So today is Keeping Safe in Missoula. Uh, we will see the men and women who protect our city and how the police and fire department work together. Uh, we have um, Missoula Fire Department Chief Jeff Brandt. There you go. There he is. Here. <laughs> Assistant Chief Brad Davis. Present? Present. Okay, Chief Mike Brady from the Police Department. And the session is going to be hands on, interactive, and lots of fun. Um, we're going to have breakout sessions, so we'll kind of do a rotate kind of thing. Um, the PD has the SWAT van and the bomb robot here, is that right? Yes. Okay, great. And uh, the fire department has lots of surprises in store. <laughs> uh, last week people stayed after the session and went and socialized next door to city council. You know where that is and everybody enjoyed that. Tonight's session is going to go a little longer, so it's going to go past 9 o'clock. So maybe instead of going to the bar, maybe you'd like to stay and catch some more stuff. And Chief, will there be a chance for participants to ride the ladder truck? Possibly. Ah, the ladder truck goes up 100 feet. It's really something else. I have been up in it. So w let's get started with this action-packed evening right now. So here we oh, go. Jane, one Thank more thing. Sorry, we had someone ask about, um, it was Blaine had asked about at, uh, names of folks. Did you want to talk about that? Well, I, I, did, I didn't want to do that tonight. You oh. need to go around because we have so much to okay. do tonight. Right, we'll do so we'll skip that tonight. Thank you. All right. All right. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys first of all for coming out and uh, I know that possibly expectations are high so <laughs> we hope to meet all of those meet and exceed all those expectations the same thing that uh, Chief Brady and I always expect from our uh, law enforcement and firefighters so tonight uh, I don't mean to be redundant but Chief Brady and I uh, have with assistance for sure uh, I've created just a couple PowerPoints. This is going to be a quick overview, and this is supposed to be jazz hands, as I always right. kind of thing. Uh, yep. What is the problem? I don't know if I can promenade and, and turn, <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll, it is going to be sh a lot of show and tell. And we just want to try to give you the best experience safely, as safe as we can, but give you a good, a good overview of some of the many things obviously everything we do law enforcement does we can't introduce you in in a couple of hours introduce you in a couple hours or art mike and i had talked chief brady and i had talked that you know really to be able to promote and take this opportunity to promote our departments we could really use a night of peace and we may be looking at something like that down the road so without that further ado we will go through my stuff so missoula fire department and we handle a lot of different things. Oh, I should introduction. So, oh, you introduced Brad. Chief Brad. In the back, we have our battalion chief, Dave Walter, who has a tablet in his hand. He's in charge of the city tonight for all operations. Uh, Jamie Porter is also a fire inspector. She's also a firefighter. Captain Robert Hanneman is firefighter captain. We have Sarah, who is one of our record specialists and admin support team. There's six of us at admin support team. And then this is Dave Smith. He is a senior firefighter, a paramedic, and now he has been newly assigned to our EMS, emergency management, emergency, <laughs> EMS coordinator, which is emergency management safety system coordinator. So he takes care of all of our certifications and provides all of our medical training, and he will be doing one of our stations tonight. So, quick overview for the fire department. You folks as local government, 
Citizen Academy and citizens, or is everybody a citizen of the city? Is yes. that one of the requirements? Yep. Yep. So off, obviously off, off of your operating dollars, uh, the fire department operates with a $14.7 million budget. And that is, uh, that housing, and I've got some inventory staff real quick on the other end. Uh, so that's how our pie chart breaks out. And then from 2007 to 2018, this is our, our call volume. And we are growing rapidly. As everybody can feel that synergy in the city, as everybody can see how busy. Uh, and, and I think Vitality is also something to add to that, right? We're growing and, and stretching at the streams, and it is taxing our first responders. But that is our call volume. I don't know if you can see that. Everybody has, does have a handout in there. But we did reach our, reach our point of 9,000 calls this last year. In our master fire plan in 06, we were predicted to hit 9,000 calls until 2022. Mm -hmm. So we are a little ahead of that. When you say calls, are the 911 numbers go to you if they're fire related? Is that how that works? Correct. Okay. Correct. Yep. Calls for service. So our inventory, we've got five stations, uh, two assisting, two, two other facilities, the burn tower, which you guys will get to see tonight and work in, and a boathouse down on, on the river, which houses our, our water rescue craft. We had jet boats, a jet boat for a long time in that river. We made a good leap forward when we purchased two rescue watercrafts, jet skis, if you guys have seen us on the river. Uh, outstanding work in pairs, we can cover the river. It drafts about eight inches of water rather than what a jet boat does and we can navigate uh, the Clark Fork and down south as that gets braided out as everybody knows and, and we can respond quicker and we're not relying on one motor we have two motors for that. So. And the other compliments that come along with that. You're just kind of building that. Oh it's not rotating. Sarah said that if I hit the wrong button. You can plug your computer in. <laughs> Talk fast. Talk fast. <laughs> All right. So we'll get some power. To, uh, a large component. One of the great programs that we have in this fire department that we really rolled up into and leaned into the last five years is the Wildlands program. Now we've had that for since 1995-96 when we soft toed into that. Uh, soft towing into that was a tip, the administration at the time said no more than 45 miles away. That's all you can go because you know what's important is to protect our infrastructure here in town. Uh, since that, we have grown that program, and we have had folks in Alaska, and we've had engines in Florida, and that serves a lot of. That serves all kind of training needs. That serves all kind of incident command training, paid training, and it also brings dollars back to uh, the school. Old Road, Talk a little bit about that wildland program on the right. This was one of the cool shots that that, uh, that we've seen at Sarah Found uh, on just our regular structure fire. We average eight to nine structure fires a month in the city of Missoula. Uh, we're pretty proud that about 85% of those we catch in the room of origin because you folks have provided us with the money and resources and a water system um, that we can get folks on scene and affect change quickly and get to instant, instant stabilization. So, to outfit a firefighter costs about, about $9,600. Now, the, the SCBA that he's wearing, self-contained breathing apparatus, is about 6,500. That's a really large purchase, and we don't have that for every person. We have several, we have those for folks on the rig. We have those uh, for extras uh, that we have in case we have call-in crews. Um, we actually have we have a 95 personnel. We have about 60 air packs and and extra bottles for that. So. But the coats, the turnouts, the helmet, the gloves is uh, about 3500 bucks to, to stand a person up to get him uh, into and ready for wildland firefighting, along with the three-month uh, training program. Yes. Are they 45 minutes or 60 minute SDAs? Uh, ours are 30. 30. 30. They do make them 45, they do make them 60. 
What is their lifespan? Uh, lifespan is 15 years, right? Yep. Like 15. 15 years. Yep. And so. it's uh, dictated by the bottle. Um, was that high pressure bottle? That's 4,500 psi that's in that bottle. So. We got a grant to replace ours last time. Uh, we were successful in grant writing. Uh, we got, we received $320,000, $340,000. Our SCBAs are due in four more years and we will be looking at about an $800,000 replacement for the uh, same, same pack. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, do you have a federal lead? Like is there somebody you can go to with brands? You bet, yeah, no, we're in close communication so with uh, that state department. It is, it's, 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 it's a federal and uh, there's a, it's an AFG grant, Assistant Firefighters Grant, and there's also another oh, avenue okay. of a safer grant, which are used for personnel. AFG grant is for equipment. These are some of the pictures that we have done and, and instances that we're on. The flooding, as you can see in the lower left, which I did a little pointy thing, that was the floods this spring. High rise training. That was one of our rescue crafts along search and rescue boat in the, in the water. Uh, in the middle here is something that uh, we have we've been working on, but it's finally coming together for Missoula County. Uh, law enforcement, of course, is the huge leader in active shooter, and we are participating in that holistically in this county. And uh, Chief Mike, I'm sorry if I'm treading on any of your stuff, but th this is one of the most broadest reaching programs that I've seen, encompassing projects that I've seen. I've been here 26 and a half years. This is Fish and Game, this is Highway Patrol, this is Sheriff, um, local law enforcement, and all of us together. This is Fridgetown and, and uh, Missoula Rural and, and City Fire, and all of those organizations coming together and, and putting together that active shooter, uh, is it called criminals? Alert training, yeah, but uh, it, it's that uh, it's that training together, working as as we would obviously, in my opinion, be absolutely negligent if we did not. We have always had a mass casualty plan forever, but we're really getting into some good roots of active shooter, what that means, certified trainers in place, training everybody in the county. So if something was to happen in, were to happen in Frenchtown, holistically in our county. You're deploying those assets to there to try to stabilize that incident as quick as possible. You said you're new employees get three months of introduction training? Yes, sir. At, at the Missoula Fire Department, we have three months that they go into a full academy before they have the ability to step on an engine and act as a, as a fire What sort of background do most of the people that you hire have that it come from? Well, because, um, because this field has become very competitive, we tip, in Missoula City, we see about 100 to 110 applicants every year. We have a consortium that we're part of. We run about 300 to 400 applicants, and that's uh, shared by 11 of the major cities in Montana. At that place, they take a written test and a physical test, and if they pass those, then they can come and pick packets from whatever city. If you want to, if you don't care, you want to be a fireman, you can pick up all 11 packets. And then in Missoula, we screen. Uh, we screen for some past experiences, we give points for four-year degree, two-year degree, paramedic, EMT, wildland firefighter, even some cooperators if you're Missoula Emergencies, you work for Missoula Electric Co-op, we give you a point and it takes so many points to get an interview. And uh, we had, I think we had over 90 people apply this last year, we interviewed 34, we will be hiring for three positions in April. Fire prevention, this is Jamie up there in her picture. This outreach program for the fire department is getting into our schools, teaching our kids about match safety, uh, egress in the homes, if there's a fire, where do you go, what do you do, kind of that stop, drop, and roll. And so we reach out countywide. Again, we have a Missoula, I'm rolling, Missoula County Fire Protection Association and cooperatively through fire departments, we roll out to all these schools. We're up in Condon teaching kids all through the county. Tonight, you will be running through the burn tower. It might look something like that. It might now if I don't hurry up. <laughs> and so uh, we'll be walking you out through there. We have a extrication 
right here inside so you're not so cold. And we have built the, the Picker CPR demo and you'll be running through those modules. And then Chief Brady, of course, will talk about what he has for you guys as well tonight. And I'll, I'll, I'll say that we're a little pressed for time and so my, Chief Brady and I will try to have uh, a question and answer at the end of this. Right to miss, so you can kind of give us there. But Chief Brady, next year. Thank you. Welcome. So my name's Mike Brady. I'm the Chief of Police. I've been with the department uh, working on 31 years. And uh, um, Tracy Bigley is our volunteer coordinator. She'll be putting up a PowerPoint here. You have it in your book. Hey Mike, can you talk up a little, a little louder, please? Yes. Thank you. Sorry. So um, Tracy Bigley, volunteer coordinator, she'll be getting the PowerPoint going. The PowerPoint is set up with uh, the different slides will be um, available at the station on your tours. So we're out in the mechanics bay here inside the fire department. We will have a patrol car. Officer Megan Bilberry will be there. She's wearing a body-worn camera. There's a camera in the car. She can talk about uh, what the police officers do on their daily duties. The patrol captain, Rick, Rich Stepper, is there. Um, the detective captain, Mike Collier, will be out there as well. Um, Assistant Chief Scott Hoffman. And then we uh, also have uh, Detective Sean Manaraxa, and he has the uh, SWAT rescue vehicle, the ARV, uh, as well as some of the SWAT equipment that uh, he has assigned. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, Detective Bob Frankie and Sergeant Paul Kelly have the, uh, what we call the EOD uh, equipment, the Explosive Ordnance Disposal Team. So they'll have the robots and things that you can uh, They'll, they'll show you how those work. So the police department is 109 sworn officers and 25 civilian positions. We have 91 male officers, and at this time right now, we have 16 females, and um, this is a little old. We have three vacant. Um, <laughs> and all our new officers go to Montana Law Enforcement Academy for 12 weeks in Helena. And then after that, they come back to the department, and they're paired up with another officer for uh, about 16 weeks, 14 to 16 weeks. So they won't see a day of their own until after they've been uh, through almost six months of training. The patrol division, obviously, that's the majority of the officers that are wearing the blue uniform every day. They are the majority of the department. They work in six patrol squads. There's the schedules. Uh, and then within that division, there's several specialties, and uh, we can uh, explain those uh, out there in our session. But there's a couple of keys there. The, the BID officer is a business, business improvement district officer. That's funded, uh, about half funded through the uh, business improvement district. So they pay to have a full-time police officer downtown. And we also supplement that with two other officers um, in, the, in the spring and in the late summer because we have our school resource officers, of which there's six, and they come out in the summertime. And so they'll ride the bikes, work the trails, and work downtown. We also have a traffic sergeant, and then we have four traffic officers, and those are the ones that you'll see on the motorbikes in the summer. Uh, crash investigators are civilian positions. And then four community service specialists are civilian positions. We've had those. We started out with two four years ago. We added two more. They do our parks and trails patrols. They do the, uh, a lot of educational effort um, in the parks and on the trails for dogs, uh, leash laws, city ordinance violations. They also do, uh, they have the ability to write citations for city ordinance violations. So that's the, uh, um, they address some of the issues related to um, transient use or improper use of facilities and also for the uh, drinking in the parks and, and behavior that is inappropriate in the parks. The police department handles right around 60,000 calls for service a year. The, uh, the trend of our calls for service, if you look here, um, the citizen calls are those calls that come through 911. And so those continue to trend upwards. 
the uh, officer initiated calls, uh, all of those, um, the activities, uh, the, the uh, traffic stops, the extra patrols, and all of those things that they try to do when they're not answering a call for service. We've been running really short staffed for over a year now. So you'll see that our calls for 911 have continued to go up, but our um, officer initiated activities and our traffic activities have dropped because we've had to reassign our traffic units to the vacancies on the squads that are answering the daily calls for service. Right now, um, we have five, five officers in training and we have three vacancies. So we're still continuing to try to get up to speed. And with it taking six months from the day to hire until they're on the street, it continues to take some time to do that. I mentioned our community service specialists. The administrative division is, uh, they're the people that, the police department has a 24 hour line that you can call and make a report. If you don't need to see an officer, you can call our desk and make a report. And they do about three, a little over 3,000 reports a year. There's five assigned to that. Um, we have four in our records position. Every report that's written has to pass through a records division, has to meet uh, state and federal guidelines before it can be submitted to the Board of Crime Control for uh, um, record keeping. And our evidence is also handled in the administrative division. We were fortunate enough to just uh, in June move into a new evidence facility. It's the first time in the entire time I've been a police officer that we've had adequate space for storage of our evidence. The 24 hour desk, there's the numbers on that. Over 48,000 phone calls a year. Um, and then uh, the actual physical reports that are written is, is there below. Our volunteer unit, which Tracy is in charge of, they do a tremendous amount of work for our department. Um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 volunteers at a time. And they, I think last count was around 4,000 volunteer hours a year. We've also got a, an outstanding intern program in conjunction with the uh, ge geography department and sociology department at the University of Montana. And as you can see there at the bottom, we, we gain a tremendous amount from having those people come in, do an internship. We pay a stipend for them to work for us through their uh, programs. And then we work really hard to retain them and have them apply and become members of our department. Abandoned vehicles, it's a, it's a program that um, there's, there's abandoned vehicles and there's um, a lot of new concerns about abandoned motorhomes, abandoned campers, um, camping in vehicles. So there's many different things now that we're having to address, but the abandoned vehicle program alone gets um, 1,500 complaints a year. We end up towing around 100, well, we towed 131 in, in 2017 and um, that were auctioned. We, if it's left on a street for more than five days without being moved, it gets tagged. If you don't move it, then we go back around, check, and then we tow it. Then we try and make notifications. Have you come and collect it, pick it up. If you don't, then it goes to auction. Detective division. Captain Collier is out here. He'll be able to answer any questions you have. There, uh, there's um, 20 assigned to that division. It includes all felony cases. So that's any case that requires further follow-up, whether it be a homicide or a theft over $1,500 that would go to that division if there's any um, information that would lead to follow-up. We. Uh, um, in our new location over on Catlin Street, we're able to have space to co we co-locate a U of M PD detective with us, as well as two crime victim advocates. And the cases assigned to that division are around 1,200, a little high, 1,200 each year. So 
So our special teams, we talked about that earlier. So the SWAT team, the, the bomb team, and uh, they'll be out here with their uh, equipment to show you. Okay. Go ahead. These are the top 10 calls of each year. So traffic stop is considered a call, it's considered a call for service. And um, the extra patrols are all those things that uh, are the officer initiated activities where we try and target problem areas. Those come out as an extra patrol. Go ahead, <coughs> the, the most important part of, of our job is making this a safe community for you and your support in doing that is essential. We have the downtown business owners helping assist in paying for a full-time police officer down there. Missoula County Public Schools um, pays to have, they, they pay a portion of the salaries related to five officers and Hellgate Elementary pays um, half of a position for their school. Are we done? Okay, we're done. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So real quick, count off one, two, three. We divide up into three groups. So after this, uh, what's going to happen right now is that we need to count off on threes. One, two, three, one. Three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. All right, remember your numbers. Remember your numbers. We're going to go out as a group outside so everybody get your coats on. We're going to only keep you out there for maybe 20 minutes. Um, I got safety glasses here. I would like everybody to have some form of eye protection on. We have hearing protection. Functional. So this is going to be a demo of a typical structure fire. We've got the bird town on fire as we Ooh, speak what? right now. It's warming up for us right now. You guys will roll out there. We'll just see our agents coming in. Ladder come up. Uh, sure. Uh, okay. Make sure these have the opportunity to get and then we're going to tie you in with Jamie Porter and our training officer Mike Thurlow when we get out there. And then myself and Jamie and probably a couple other will be with you guys. If you have any questions about what's going on, we're going to be there to inform you of what they're doing, why they're doing it, answer any questions, and kind of just walk you up to the building a little bit and back you off and kind of do things like that. So, no, just some sort of something on your hands. After after the burn tower, we divide up. Yeah. I guess the big thing is we also want you all to kind of stay away from from the building because we are going to be doing some construction and so stuff can't fall down.
squeeze it. <laughs> okay? Because that is toxic smoke up there. Okay, hey, Corey, you got some good rollover coming. So you guys yeah, see the flames starting to break out? Yeah. That's right before the whole room starts to fully engulf in flames. <laughs> so the difference was a thousand degrees up high, it was about 250 degrees lower. Okay? So, so where do you want to be? You can manipulate the flames with the oxygen control and maybe um, different, yeah. different scenarios. Yeah, I mean it's all about ventilation. That's one of the reasons we try to do our best to actually control ventilation in a building. Um, because the last thing we want to do is to add more oxygen that can direct the fire. So if we want to direct the fire, you know, we want it out. But right. in the meantime, we don't want to get trapped. We don't want our guys to, you know, have you know, push flame towards where our guys are. Right, right. And they say guys, be guys, gals, sure. etc. Um, so it's just so what he's talking about is the smoke so pattern coming out of here down. and pushing out the sides. You guys heard those saws fire up a little bit ago, so that crew is going to be on a vertical ventilation. So they're going to take the ladder truck up, they're going to cut a hole in the roof. So as this, this, this build, building is sealed up, that smoke's trying to find its way out, it banks down and it builds the heat up there and the smoke gets pushed down. So if we give that smoke and heat a place to go, as it goes up, it'll improve visibility and temperatures inside the, the structure so we can make entry. And you see them, they were grabbing their tools, they were starting those saws, they do that up all on the ground. So once they get on the roof, they're not going to be monkeying around. The saw doesn't start, they have all their tools ready to go. So we want to get on the roof, cut the hole, and get off as quickly as we can. It's all about getting up there, getting your job done, and getting back on. And you try to coordinate all your ventilation with the attack. Because if you come in and you're attacking and you're not giving that heat anywhere to go, or if you ventilate early and nobody's in there to put water on there, then you kind of get on there, which is bad as well. So. truck without having to actually get out on the roof. If we do have to get out on the roof, we're going to get out, excuse me, get out real quick, make our cuts. We have some roof ladders that we can do to help spread our weight out on the roof. Um, but we get the, ba the basket up there and the safest place we can be is on that. So if the roof was to collapse or anything like that, but you can do everything from that basket. So at times you're going to have to step out and do some work. They'll step off that, make their cut, get right back on that and then get out of the way. Wow. Can everybody hear each other or talk to each yep. other? Yep, have so like a everybody's got portable radios, so we communicate with portable radios. When we're doing aerial operations, there's an intercom system between the guy up top and the guy running the basket down here. Okay. And so he can talk hands-free, and anything he says, they're going to be able to hear down there. The guy at the bottom does have to push a button to talk to him, but he's he's got time to do that. These guys, can they can holler at him, and he can hear everything they're saying without having to do a radio or push any buttons. This also has the capability of water. So right now we're using it for a ventilation tool, a ladder, an elevated ladder. So if we have to go defensive, if there's a big fire, we need to put water from an elevated stream, we can actually pump water up that pipe and then spray water out of that. And we can direct that stream from up there and we can stay back away from fire and actually put water down from an elevated stream. Every once in a while you hear an alarm going on. Those are our Pressurize that building. Right? And so if someone does not move for about 30 seconds, then it starts alarming. All we have to do is kind of wiggle a little bit and it'll stop. But if we have a firefighter going down, there is no wiggling. And so it gets louder and louder until the point where it's in full alarm and you basically have to go and truly turn it off and make it stop. If you guys are interested in watching this vertical ventilation, you can kind of shift over this way and see that, <clears throat> at least that section of it. Oh no. Start the fire in What's that? What do you use to start the Typically fire? we put pallets in there oh. and then we just use a propane torch to start it. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> we stay away from burning anything, especially for our training burns like any like couches or anything like that because of the smoke that comes off of that is so harmful. So we try to use this clean wood, this clean pallets and stuff. So that's why the smoke's white. And if you see a structure fire, it's black. It's from all that plastics and all that other synthetics and stuff like that that are in houses. So, I mean, technically it's never healthy to be inside a fire, but this is better for you guys as well. Correct. I mean, we're still, we're, we would never go into this without a full mass seal, but this type of smoke, clean wood, is definitely better than that black, nasty, synthetic and plastic and arsenic-laced smoke, yeah. And even for the people who are just like, I mean, like, 
like you're doing on the mascot right now. Right. This is better. This is much better. This is this is like sitting around a campfire roasting roasting marshmallows or whatever. So, this is so crazy. <laughs> we have friends who are school jumpers. Yeah. And so I've seen that and we got to go watch them kind of do their demo and jump out of planes but this is like a whole different <laughs> And what we're demonstrating here today is just a, this is a, this is like a, what you'd call a bread and butter structure fire. We're, this would be a house is on fire, room and contents, we show up, pull a water line, do vertical operations, cut, water, overhaul, we're done. This is a pretty straightforward type scenario. So what's the, what I mean, I guess for your structure fires, if you have eight a month, how many are straightforward versus totally not straightforward? Um, we keep them pretty straightforward. Like Chief Brant said, just our ability to get there so fast. And a lot of times, if we can get them in a room, we don't have to do the big ladder operation. So if we can catch them like in a bedroom or on the stove, then they're easy. We go in with just one hand line or just an extinguisher, just put it out and we're done. Um, so the bread and butter ones are the ones that you haven't gotten there in time or so well, has a notice in time yep, or yeah, it's gotten way yep, more advanced. You bet, them. yeah. Okay. Are you having to deal more with the meth lab fires now too? And yep. Toxic Yep, absolutely. Yeah, that's always, um, yeah, that started ramping up 10, 15 years ago when we, we pushed out a bunch of awareness. So, like, that was kind of that time frame when you're, like, going to a structure fire. It's not just going in and worrying about smoke. It's worrying about uh, explosions and chemicals and needles and this, all kinds of stuff. So you always have to, as you approach these, you know, you just have to kind of be aware of that for sure. It's just an ad added added hazard that you have to be aware of. Yeah. Put it on the list. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, we've had, I mean, you had them with people that have like reloading stations in their house where you have gunpowder and, and bullets popping off. And people storing propane or gas inside their houses and stuff. And, oh, yeah, barbecuing on like right outside on like a deck on the second floor. Propane tanks on them. And it's, it's, yeah, yeah, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, there was, I've been to one, there was a guy, I, I'm not to, it is what it is, but he would keep a mason jar of gasoline in his basement on his wood burning stove because that's what he used to light his fire every night. And yeah, yeah, so that fell off once and broke when he had his fire going. And that's, I mean, so just. All the guns in Montana, everybody has ammunition. Yeah, there was, yeah, there was a fire behind my house. I live in Lolo. And there was a fire two blocks behind me six months ago. And about 1.30 in the morning, my wife and I are in bed, and we hear this pop, 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 pop. I'm like, what is that? And I open my window, the house is on fire, and he had just a whole bunch of ammunition in there that was just going off for 10 minutes straight of this bullet. Those firefighters, you probably stay away and tell that soldier. We, we try to, yeah, if we can. If somebody's in there, all bets are off. But yeah, if we can, we will, for sure. I don't know if you guys noticed the smoke, how it changes to more of a steam now. So that means they've got water on the fire. It's 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 more well it's more exaggerated if it's in a house that has synthetics and plastics where that smoke is really dark to begin with. This stuff was, we're burning clean wood, so it wasn't super dark, but you, we call this a steam conversion. You know, so if we're interior, fire's knocked down, we got good steam conversion. You can see from outside that they put water on it because you just instantly see it turn to that white fluffy stuff instead of that heavy dark smoke. You know, you always see national news when a fireman rescues a kitten that has a little CPR thing on it. Oh yeah. Yes, one of things for that. We do. One of our one of our fire one of the one of the vid, the pictures that went viral probably five or six years ago was one of our guys. It really? was on a fire over whoops, excuse me. Uh, one a fire over on the rattlesnake. CPR to the kitten Yeah and he had the oxygen on the kitten and, and it was and that picture for whatever reason just went wow, so cute. just worldwide. Like it was it's in magazines, it's all over the <laughs> Out, save the kittens. Yeah, yeah. How do you guys maintain this building? So you guys just cut through something on the top? Do you think? Yeah, so on the top there's a hole. It's a, co it's a concrete building, and then there's a hole, and then we have two by tens bolted to the concrete, so you can put a sheet of plywood, screw it down. And then we, when we go up there, we just cut the plywood, 
unscrew it, throw a new one on there, and so we can do that over and over again. Yeah. Does it matter like where the structure is cut? Like you guys have to like make that decision when you. Yep. Yep. So you can actually control some of that heat and fire. Typically, you want to get as directly above the seat of the fire as you can. So like if there's a fire in the house over here, if I cut a hole over here, then that smoke and heat can go across the attic or across the house before it comes up. And so we can use it to move fire if we need to, okay. but typically, nine times out of 10, we're gonna try to know where the fire is and go right above it. Okay. And so all that heat just goes straight up instead yeah. of migrating throughout the house. And then as far as like on the roofs, this one's not a great prop. Um, we do have the ability, but you can put one like two by six in the middle but you try not to cut the supports of the roof. Right. Um, even though you're not going to be standing right where you're cutting, you still don't want to weaken it. Right. So as you're cutting it, we train everybody. When you have the chain size, you come in, you make your cut, you'll rip down, and as you're coming across, you're actually feeling for that, that stud. So you'll cut, you're cutting through shingle and cutting through the, the roof material, but then when you hit those trusses, you come up, okay. you know, then you're only about a half inch deep, and then you plunge back down, and then you can actually make a cut and then use that pike pole and push it and it'll make a, like a wing. It'll just hinge on that. And you're just trying, you just don't want to cut through those supports and weaken anything, so. Thank you guys for coming Do they control that? What's that? Which group are you going? Um, we'll just get back inside and then we'll, we'll spread it. We'll do the ones and the twos and the threes. I don't know who's going where. You've got that, so I follow you. Oh, I got you. I'm <laughs> roving. I'm roving. I see what you're getting at. I'm going to actually be going kind of in between. Um, well, why don't we go to the, the middle bay where they're going to do the car extrication okay. and we'll go there. Okay. Yeah, so if everybody wants to stand behind this yellow line here, that would be great. That way it give us uh, room to work and no one gets hurt. Um, my name is Garrett. I worked here at City Missoula for 20 years. This is Jason. He's been here for um, 12? Yeah, almost 12. 12 years. We go by Biscuit and Gravy. <laughs> Actually, Biscuit and Gravy. Okay? Um, Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna show you how we extricate patients out of vehicles when they're wrecked. So this car's already wrecked, as you can see. Um, this is pretty typical. Uh, this car, car I rear-ended somebody here. Uh, this was done at the, uh, done at the uh, Pacific Yard or Red Stone or something like that. Or it could have got rear-ended, you know, it could have hit someone there and then got hit from behind as well, like a three-car pile. First thing that we need to do is make sure that the patients are stable in here and they're not going to get any more injured, okay? So we do patient care. We'll throw a guy in there, we'll, or we'll get through the window and make sure that they're stabilized the best we can. Airway, we've got to prop their head up. Do whatever we can to make sure that their airway's packed, okay? We might use an ambulance crew member to jump in there, and then we'll stick a tarp over them and the patient so they don't get any glass on them or any metal on them, okay? And we're gonna have to start popping these doors, and it's pretty violent sometimes, so we just have to protect them. We're throwing these backboards in here for protection, because they're hard, okay? So if our tools protrude inside the cab, it's not gonna hurt the patient. If any, if any glass pops and gets out, it's gonna hit the board, okay? Because this is where we, we, we wanna protect the patient. Now, we, we, we really try to go from the unaffected side or the uh, less damaged side of the vehicle. So if we have a person that's been T-boned here and they're injured right here in the, in the driver's seat, I'll, we'll go around and try to access it from that side, okay? Because once we start cutting on this side, if their body is touching anything plastic or metal here, it's gonna vibrate into their flesh and that's just gonna cause a lot of pain and suffering. So we wanna try and go on the other side. So we're just going to demonstrate to you how we're going to open up this car and create more space for the patient and the providers, which are us. Because extrication is all about creating space, okay? Creating space. All right. Uh, we're going to show you how we're going to stabilize the vehicle, okay? First of all, Jason's going to show you how these, our new trucks work. So when we jump off the engine, these two are basically married up. They slide together real nice, and then you got a little, uh, you just carry them together, and then we unbuckle it, and then we take the pin out, the pin comes out, slide this up, goes on the outside, pin goes back in, and now we have 
great piece of cribbing, and these are awesome because we used to have chunks of wood and different sizes and stuff like that. And these are just slick because, well, you'll see in a second. He's going to lift the car up just enough so I can get a good purchase point. Put this in. Come 
good hold of C-spine on the patient in there. We're trying not to make them move a whole lot. Okay?
Besides that, um, we get them out pretty quick. How about the new electric vehicles? Yeah, so th those are an issue for us. Um, we, if they're on fire, we, we still have to we still have to make it safe for the patient. We still have to try to try to make it safe for the patient. So we're going to do a fire attack on that vehicle too. Then we, we do our, a lot of classroom uh, study time on how to make that vehicle safe for us and the patient once we start cutting into it. Because all the new vehicles, you know, a lot of those have a lot of the, the, the powers and the floorboards and stuff like that. We, so we, we study on that and we have classes on that because, the, I mean, they're coming out every day. Those. Have you rolled on any of those yet? I have, I have personally have not. Have you guys? Yeah. And yeah did, did you have an issue with it? Uh, a Prius, which one of the nice things, uh, a lot of them will run that, the high voltage 600 volt lines down that center of the vehicle. So the impacts and stuff that Garrett's kind of showing you around, typically don't get into that core. It's when, you know, you get into the real high speed stuff that you may see that impinged more. But um, the other thing they've done is they've done a real good job of having disconnects in it. So a lot of times with the, the impacts, um, they'll trigger a disconnect on their own and kill a lot of that power. So the 600 volts is something they don't want to get into with that. So. Yeah. And, and another big uh, problem for us is our airbags. There's airbags up here, all, all by everybody's head now, and the Range Rovers, and, and you name it now. I mean, they're coming out everywhere to make them safe, the SOBs, and, and all the high-end vehicles. And a lot of the, uh, the American-made vehicles are, are coming out with them. So, purchase points, we gotta make sure we're below a certain, uh, you know, airbag. So, 
So um, we're, we, we are constantly learning all the time when it comes to these vehicles uh, that are out there. It, it is a problem. Yeah, it's safer it for the occupant and it's more hazardous for us. Now. Yeah, so, yeah But it point. is definitely safer for the occupant. Oh, yeah. Can yeah. be. Can be. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah, I'm sure they. I'm sure it can. I'm sure you know. I'm sure it can. You know, and it's the, it's uh, the gases and those fumes. So they can pop. Heat makes everything bad. <laughs> so, anybody have any questions for us? That that did take longer than I expected. But you know what? Not every scene is the same. What? Not every car is the same. Not every fire is the same. Everything. And not every medical aid is the same. We, everything is. We just went. Oh my gosh. This is gonna happen. Okay, well, let's just improvise and keep going. And just keep going. Yes? About how many times a year do you need to use this equipment? About. Oh, gosh. I would say roughly eight to 10. Probably. Okay. On vehicles, but, but we're using them more all the time for uh, for homes, uh, businesses. If we, have, if we have to pop doors that are steel doors and stuff, I'm taking the spreader up to the door and I'm popping it. Well, I'm sure not going to kick that in. Oh, well, I might. <laughs> no, just kidding, just kidding. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's it, guys. Uh, you guys are, if there's no more questions, then you guys are moving that way, I believe, to station three. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there, guys. Yeah. So welcome, and uh, we'll start down here. We've got uh, we've got Heather Harp trying on the equipment. So, um, we've also got a bomb suit over here that if somebody wanted to put it on, we'd put it on you. So we've got Tracy Bigley, volunteer coordinator here, um, Sean Manuaxa, uh, detective, and. The specialty units, the, the EOD um, SWAT team, are in addition to their regular duties. So they could be a patrol officer or a detective, but then this would be in addition to their regular duties. Captain Rich Stepper, he's in charge of patrol. Basically, if you see someone wearing a uniform on duty, then they work in the patrol division. Um, officer Megan Bil Bilbrey is a patrol officer. Um, she is wearing a body alarm, she can explain that, she can talk about the car and the equipment in the car. Um, she is three years old and came to us from Tucson and so she's one of, she's one of the officers that had um, a post academy prior to getting here so um, her time was shorter in training because she had an Arizona account. Um, officer or Detective Bob Frankie is uh, has the EOD stuff here. He can help you uh, understand the uh, ARV as well as the bomb robots and equipment. Sergeant Paul Kelly, he's also in our detective division, and he's uh, been with EOD for a number of years. So, um, some of the interesting things that you might want to talk to these guys about are the training that they go through. Pretty extensive training. And then we have Assistant Chief Scott Hoffman, and Mike Collier is our captain of the detective division, so all of our investigative uh, people work for him, and uh, he can answer those questions for you. So we're just letting you wander around, ask your questions, and look at what you have an interest in, in seeing. So thank you. Thank you. Want to try it? Really sure. Come on. Oh, well, you already did this one.
Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, like, so what's the um, I mean, I guess that seems like the hanging fruit for my question, which is what's something that is in the car now that like makes the officer's job easier? Or, 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 um, we're really thinking all about the programs. Every department has different programs they'll use for things. Um, so like I said, I came from Arizona, so we have a program there. So yeah. kind of, you have a radio up front. This is actually the radio. You have a radio yeah. head up front. Uh, the video camera system. Mm -hmm. So the DVR. Okay. This is the DVR. Uh, cradle point, so you have a Wi-Fi system, so that uh, when they pull up next to the station, all of their video is automatically downloaded. Okay. These officers never have physical uh, control or contact with uh, the data that gets brought into these, as far as video is concerned. All so right. all of that is. Is that forward-looking uh, from the dash, or is that going to be inside is, the cab? There is one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That points back into the the passenger area in the right, back. Right. Then there is one camera which is a panoramic camera. Okay. That goes from post to post and out. And then there's one camera that goes straight forward. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, and then if you look on Megan's shirt, she's got a body worn camera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that body worn camera and all of these camera systems uh, they interlace. So when she turns on her light bar, her cameras turn on, her body worn camera turns on. Uh, her body worn camera is the microphone for all the in car camera stuff. Okay. So that she gets, if I walk up to you, I've got my body worn, and then the vehicle itself has got cameras that, that point basically in all directions. Yeah. Uh, other than the rears, there's nothing coming back. But anything um, from the front post forward and off the body of, of the officer is recorded and okay. it's downloaded into the system. The only thing they can do is mark the video event type, and that's it. So. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing how, how much it's recorded and, and saved, and how long it's saved, I mean, I mean or is it, is it tucked away, you know, after an well, arrest and an incident? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we do have a retention policy, mm -hmm. so um, just depending on the type of arrest. So if okay. it's, uh, so if the officers get into a pursuit, a vehicle pursuit, we had saved, I believe, for three years. There's so many retentions on this stuff. Uh, a traffic uh, violation is saved for a year. Um, a miscellaneous, which is basically, uh, they test their lights and they test their system every day. When they turn on their lights, their camera comes on. That's yeah. saved for 90 days. Uh, everything is saved yeah. based on yeah. a retention uh, system. It's actually uh, on our policy uh, at the city website. So you can get on there and it, it'll yeah. tell you exactly what sure. everything is saved for. Right, right. Uh, I think the most, uh, the longest it's saved is a lifetime, and that is for uh, serious events like, like homicides or other things where we cannot get rid of the evidence ever. Right. So right. we have to maintain that evidence for, well, for eternity. Sure, sure. Or at least as long as this system <laughs> exists or survives, right? Right, right, right. And is this standard? Um, all the cameras and everything from all of your vehicles? This is the second year, uh, this is the second year that we've had this particular vehicle. So if you look, uh, any any previous uh, patrol cars, uh, previous to last year, they have, we had uh, these MDCs or these mobile data computers up front uh, through L3. It would be the, the same mobile data computers that they have in the, the uh, tanks in the, in the okay. U.S. military. Okay. These, I mean, they were indestructible, but they they were also enormous, and yeah. they were just they were just really not that usable. And Chrysler last year started building their computers into the car. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so now we could get rid of that 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 projectile because it was. I've seen where police officers have gotten into crashes, and yeah. you know those things. Yeah, ten pound laptop flying yeah. around. Yeah. I think it was like twenty. Oh geez. Yeah, so okay. they're huge. Yeah. So right now this is this is standard. We're we're trying to every year we replace a portion of our fleet and as we replace that portion of our fleet, we're going to the new watch guard system, we're going to this new camera system, and we're going to the new body worn system. So I mean you know, you hate to talk dollars and cents, but just just the camera system itself with the body worn is is about fifty five hundred, six thousand dollars per vehicle. Um, these cars cost, it's actually a screaming deal, uh, 
these cars cost about thirty-two, thirty-three thousand dollars, but that's with nothing yeah. in them. Yeah. And, and then we have to put the maintenance package. Then we have to put the police and, stuff in them. Yeah. And that's yeah. an additional twenty thousand okay. dollars. So, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it starts getting a little spending. Right. So yeah. I think. Yeah. We have to take care of our public tax dollars, right? So we just can't go out and spend uh, a pile of cash. Those vehicles that are a little older still have usable systems in them, so we maintain two systems at the same time. And as those systems go out of date, they will just continue to replace them with the watch card system. So we'll use those older systems until they're no longer usable and the fleet has been completely replaced, and we'll just have entirely watch card. About four years. Three years. Yes. So, four years from now, all of us in the office will be in Yes, they will. That will make you happy. So, it does. I, I will say what I do like about WatchGuard is, um, you know, you really struggle with reliability of equipment, right? So, you want our officers to be able to, I think, for them, and I can see it, when they go into the uh, briefing room and they look up on the board and they've got a car they like, this is the car I like to drive every day, and if that car doesn't work, then they're angry, <laughs> and then I kind of hear about it a little bit, and so if you can start to get the stuff that is reliable when they get into the vehicle, it always works, and it doesn't always need to be fixed, and they can get it, get onto their shift, do their business, and, and start off. Uh, on a good note, I think it's a good thing. Yeah. So, and it doesn't seem to. I don't have to send it back to the manufacturer. And the body worn cameras aren't breaking all the time, and the battery life on these cameras is substantially better yeah. than the, the, the battery life on the other cameras. And so, uh, so far, the system has been great. I really like. It. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like it's actually safer. Such a system like this is going to capture everything. Oh, yeah. And so you know, people that are going to be doing things behind your back because there's a camera right there. You know what I mean? Well, it's. Not that, it, not that you're going to rest on your laurels or, or yeah. just expect to have everything. You have your back. You know what I mean? From, or am I not thinking? No, 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 no. I, I don't disagree with that. I, I do think that uh, the camera systems do a lot of things for us. Uh, they, they provide uh, civil protection for the officers because it's my belief. Um, I have 80 people in the patrol group, and I think they're the finest men and women in, around, yeah. right? So I, th I think they do a great job all the time. And having the ability uh, for them to wear a camera and, and record everything that they do throughout the day, and then come back, and if somebody does file a complaint, they know, hey, I did a good job all day. I didn't do anything wrong. The supervisor can quickly watch a video, listen to the audio, and and I will say 99% of the time, it seems, that those officers are doing the right thing for the right reason all the time. And so it does a very good job of, of civil liability. And it's great evidence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Mostly evidence. They, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the evidence is up. Yeah. But even if they do make a mistake, this is where you can show a very teachable moment to yes. improve because everybody can always improve with that, human that beings. Is, that is very so. correct. So, so it kind uh, of helps both ways, improving everybody. I think <laughs> and it keeps everybody in check. That's, that's what I think. So. I just met so. happy. Yep. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. So, so you said you're in the military? I, I was. Maybe. I didn't think. Yeah. 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 So it just depends on the year. It's been more recently. So we had all the advantages. So what? What are some of the? What are some of the pieces here?
So this is kind of like a, a basic loadout. I mean, obviously for the different types of things that we'll do, and we'll attach or take away pieces if necessary. Uh, these are... You know, most of it's Velcro. A lot of it's Velcro or what we call, it's called molly webbing. And so it attaches to right. the webbing. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, interlocks. Um, so we have our plates, and this is just the small one on the side. Um, uh, side armor plate. Okay. But um, it's these ones, the, the ones that are inside that are fairly heavy a piece, yeah. they're supposed to, they're supposed to uh, design to protect against high velocity rifle. Okay. And so we'll prepare for the worst and kind of like hope for the best, but right. not everybody's going to have a rifle, but you never know, so you want to be prepared in, in the eventuality that somebody does. So Sure. Um, but the, we have pockets for all the plates. Um, and then, like, and then, I guess how it fits you, the pl those things are placed in, like, are they placed in particularly vulnerable areas? Yeah, so, so basically your vital, vital, vital organ places. Okay. Um, so vital organs and the part that doesn't protect um, in here in, in, in your torso area, yeah. but your basic, your heart, your lungs, and are the, the ones that will probably, if sustained trauma, if you sustain gunshot trauma, those are the right. difficult ones to kind okay. of fix or keep you alive so those are the major ones that cover um some some of them are you so you get fitted just because everybody has different body sizes but with these ones these are kind of like they almost come standard but they make them they manufacture them in a way that they're adjustable to height and width and size uh, but the plates, the plates are kind of just standard plates and stuff like that. So as you can see, like some of the straps on here, mm -hmm. they have like adjustable buckles. And so you can take, you can take length out or in as necessary and stuff like that. Same with the sides. You can see that the buckles on the yeah. sides and behind in the webbing and back is more adjustment. So you can tension up or down as necessary. And you probably said this, but could you repeat it one more time for the camera? About how much one of these cost? Um, the vests themselves, probably about fifteen to two thousand dollars with the armor plating. So. And how heavy are they? Um, they're probably fifty pounds, fifty, yeah. fifty-five pounds a piece. So. And are, when you when you're in this, I mean, do you train to to run in it? And how? <laughs> I mean, like what? You have to go through an obstacle course okay. with all the gear on. Sure. Jumping over walls, yeah. going through culverts, running around a track. Right. Um, what else is on that? And, that, and, that, and that's like a, that'd be like a worst case scenario that you would be like on the move tracking somebody in all this gear. I mean, it sometimes, seems to sometimes. me like maybe you would be, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. So normally they set up a plan and then I realize now that my only reference is like, TV and movies, yeah. so I'm like, I have a horrible, realistic reference point here. But they do have to move quickly. Yeah. Um, sure. When they when they advance on their position. Yeah. And then when when the incident takes place and they've got to run into a house or breach a house or something yeah. like that, they've got to they got to be carrying this and they've yeah. got to be fast because yeah. the element of surprise is, is the biggest. And so for me, I mean, putting it on, right, I mean, it feels very kind of like limiting and, you're not, and, and that's why you do all the training is so that it becomes all the movements that you would normally just want to be able to do. There's there's a lot that goes on, like, um, that not even all, all the bosses see. Like, we, obviously, we train, we always train in our full gear because if you're not training like you would respond normally, then you're doing yourself a disservice. So right. wearing it all the time at trainings, you know, you get conditioned to it. And obviously people have to have uh, a higher than average level of conditioning too, because operations tend to sustain themselves for hours on end. So being able to be conditioned enough to where you're not fatiguing as fast because fatigue inhibits your abilities to respond at your optimal levels. Um, and then, you know, just different things learning learning how to put the attachments on and where where they're not going to be cumbersome or inhibit other abilities like magazine reloads you know reloads in your, your primary weapons or 
you know, like uh, medical kits, you know, I have to be able to reach them with both hands. Somebody else has to reach them too in case they need to use them on me. You know, chem lights, if I need to mark something quick, I can break a chem light and throw it in. Yeah. Just all of the standard equipment, um, our microphones, you know, my gloves are here so I can take them off and clip them on. You know, I have a dump pouch to where if I can grab, you know, a suspect's gun and after they've been disarmed or whatever, or surrendered, I can, you know, secure that and not have to worry about it. Um, extra magazines, but like I said, standard loadout, you have to figure out how can I perform at my best given this certain amount of gear and, you know, how is it going to, how is it going to affect what I do? Because obviously it's easy to do things without all of it on. I got to figure out how to do it with it all. So this, this vest, how much of it is maybe like what you would consider like you would never want to move it? And it's like, it's just, it's something that you're like, this is something that's always going to stay yeah. on here. Then how much of it is like, as you're maybe, you've gotten a call and you're trying to figure out like what the particular situation is and you'd be like, oh, I need, I don't need this, I need this. I mean, how much of that, how much, is there change or is it pretty consistent? There is change, but like I said, it's standard loadout. You know, okay. I want the ability to mark things. So I have my marking, I have a multi-tool in here. I have uh, my primary weapon ammunition, I have my secondary weapon ammunition, and a med kit. But sometimes, you know, we'll have a mechanical breach, so we'll need like a ram or, or a pry tool, or we'll have a breaching shotgun, so you have to figure out how to put that on. You know, the flashbang attachments, the distraction devices, um, sometimes gas masks, gas mask pouches and stuff to carry because if we have a chemical agent introduced into an environment, you know, I don't want to be affected by that, so I'll need my gas mask. And then just different things depending on the type of operation. You know. and, and the role that you're taking oh, on. And the role. Too. I mean, it's going to be a, between like the apprehension or uh, a, a barricaded suspect who has no hostage, you know, will probably tailor that different than a hostage rescue. You know, a hostage rescue will probably carry more devices, probably some tools to kind of covertly surveil and stuff like that from very close proximity and probably everything that we need. Plus, you know, like water, food. I can't always, I can't always leave and drive down to a restaurant, grab a snack or a gas station. So you have to have the ability to carry some sort of like sustainment as a fuel for the human, you know? Extra radio batteries and stuff like that. So it just all depends mission. So that's why we've kind of like reduced the loadout because you could have a full tactical catalog <laughs> kit on you, but you're not going to be able to sustain that type of operation, and not all the equipment is going to be necessary for those types of operations. Rural operations will probably maybe drop a plate or two if it's going to be a sustained long term out in the woods, like the David Berger thing up in Lolo a couple years, a few years back. You know, you don't want to fatigue yourself to make yourself ineffective, so we'll reduce our weight signature as much as we can while still trying to maintain the capabilities of the protections that are for us. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. How often um, do you update equipment? Because they are coming out with newer and, well, lighter yeah. <laughs> uh, black deck and stuff. How often are you able to update your equipment? Um, I think it's around every five years is the, because so right when it environment out. affects the plates, like the coating on the plates and stuff, right. and the Kevlar material, ceramic. Um, these ones aren't all composite, these ones, the side plates so are always going to be continual because they're always going to be... Yeah, so much. an officer's uh, Kevlar vest, they have a life expectancy of five years. And after the five years, the manufacturer won't guarantee that it'll stop and at the stop. It just deteriorates due to the weather, the sweating, and, and all that. So the material lasts up to five years. After that, we have to replace all those vests. Charlie Brown's OK. Um, yeah, we have met that. With those heavy porcelain vests or uh, plates and stuff, those are slightly different. But you really can't go beyond the manufacturer's date of expiration. So it goes cost quite a bit more. Um, you know the helmets, the night vision goggles, all that equipment is so expensive for a squat team. 
Which yeah. you don't use that often, yeah, but when like you need them, they it's can hurt. Be a lot, you, know, you, you can't afford <laughs> not to, or to send them out like a uniformed yeah. officer with only a vest. They have to have this other stuff. So, because they're doing the real dangerous warrants and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, they, they all have a life expectancy, and we uh, we have to be prepared for that when the time comes. So. And have you been able to keep up with that? Yeah, we try to uh, use as many federal grants as possible to help with some of the costs, but um, sometimes we go to the, the council for an increase in budget for special equipment like this. Have you been able to, I mean, have the has, have this, uh, people of Missoula as well as the city council been responsive? Very supportive, very supportive, and they understand that Personal protective equipment is probably the thing that officers yeah. need most, so they've been very supportive in getting us that. Sorry. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is a smaller of our two robots. It's an i is the company that makes it. They basically have the same capabilities. This one's just smaller, fits in, in tighter places. That one's made more for heavier duty stuff. Uh, it can pick up more. It's actually capable of dragging a, a person in a bomb suit. Um, if someone gets hurt, that robot can actually grab them and drag them out of harm's way. They're both remote control, so they do work similar. Uh, these are, they can both climb stairs, they can both fit in and out of doorways. This one is actually capable of taking the wheels up so that you can go into, like, uh, down between the seats in an aircraft. Um, this one reaches a little bit more. Uh, it, it can stand up tall, it can reach farther, and it can grab a hold. Pretty much the two differences between them both. They both do have the ability to uh, shoot off of the water cannon and stuff to destroy the creatures. Okay. And um, your protective gear. Um, oh. Is it how often do you? Well, first of all, is what's the technology behind this? Has it improved lately? Are you up to date with it? Um, as far as the suits? Yes. The suits? Yes, they're constantly evolving on that. And, you know, every couple of years, different companies call it to either a lighter version or a version that has better protection or a version that's cooler. Those suits weigh 75 pounds. It's hard to get more protection without adding more weight, but there's companies that have uh, developed newer and lighter materials to make them lighter, uh, cooler, and and just as effective or maybe even more effective at uh, protecting you from fragmentation or from blast pressure that comes off of an explosive. How, um, okay, so each generation improves. How many generations are you from the most cutting edge, do you know? Or? Uh, the, I think there's probably one version right now, and it's hard to tell because they may have a version out right now that we just haven't heard of yet. <laughs> um, but there may be more versions out now. I think there's a, there's one version that I know of that's beyond what we have. We have what's called an EOD-9. And I know there's a 10 out there, it, and they actually redesigned the whole configuration on it quite a bit, how, how you wear it and everything. And how, what's the um, time that you can probably get a new suit? I mean, do you have to get a specific grant? Does this last only a certain amount of time? No. Um, yeah, they, there are expirations on them. I don't know what they are. They don't necessarily expire, but there's a certain point where they're worn. And I think usually it's mostly when you start to see holes in them or the zippers are start to break or whatever. It's just kind of time to get a new one. Um, they're very expensive, so you usually have to wait until you get a, a grant approved for them. So you got to go and sell yourself to them and say, this is why we need this money. This is what our old suit looks like. Um, so we're needing that new one. And it's usually grants funded through the state um, that come from federal monies. Through home federal loans, monies? From home loans. And there's state funds too. So it's just way too expensive for local to be able to even think yeah. about it. Yeah. Okay. No, you're not. Yeah. yeah, just that helmet, I think, by itself is, I don't know, $35,000. Just the helmet. So, it's so pretty expensive. The city of Missoula, what can they do to help you make certain you have this equipment that you need? Um, this, 
the majority of the equipment that we have is, is it's easier to get through the through the federal funds. Mm -hmm. um, but can they help the, you get that? They, they, what they could help us with would be some of the smaller stuff that we need. Uh, and I don't I don't necessarily have a list of that, but oftentimes what we're using is hand uh, mm -hmm. Our machines are really to take the wall batteries. You know, if the wall batteries die, they might be a hundred dollars. We can't get some of that stuff through the uh, There's a, a lot of so things. So kind of here. maintenance type stuff? Excuse me? So kind of like maintenance? More maintenance type stuff, but the smaller tools. Um, mm -hmm. oh, the, just regular tools. Um, yeah. The batteries, those, those die. Things that just go away. I mean, if we have a couple pairs of pliers, those will really go away on you. But things that, that have a shelf life, the, the batteries. Um, yeah. I, I don't. I don't have yeah. my whole outfit oh, yeah, set sure. out here to be able to tell what what it is we need. Has the city been responsive to that? Well, we really haven't asked them much, other than you know what I would ask within my department for things, uniforms, stuff like that. I just ask internally in the department. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks for coming out. Um, we appreciate the chance to show off what we got out here. Um, I know you got the awesome fire and ripping up cars and everything. This is a, this is our real practical. This is kind of where we live. You saw that that huge number of calls we run. I think 76% of them are medical calls. So this is where we do good on a daily basis out there. A little biased maybe as our EMS coordinator, but um, <laughs> this is sort of our sweet spot. So. Um, you saw that graph of calls. Our, our main goal at the fire department here is to save lives, protect property, ease pain and suffering. So basically anything that gets in the way of us doing that is a problem that we look at solving. Just real quick, a couple things we have going on right now is that increase in call volume here. So that impacts our medical response quite a bit because we're out on so many more calls. So say this call, this station goes out on a call, then a medical CPR call comes in out here, that delays our response time out here. So we like to keep that within like a four minute window for us to get to those calls. So, so we're looking at all that stuff. Um, another thing we're looking at is we're, our paramedics are starting to age out a little bit in this fire department. Um, so we're looking at making some new paramedics here to keep the standard of care going that we have right now. Um, our paramedics really do make a huge difference out there uh, in the world for us. So those are just a couple of things that are on my radar right now for us to uh, take care of. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah. Has that changed over time? Do firefighters do more medical calls than maybe 30 years ago or 50 years ago? or is there I, I think that that's all ramped up quite a bit. I, I kind of started in the 70s and they they had this big this medical problem and they're like, who's gonna take care of this? And they were like, well, they're these guys sitting around the fire station. So they turned them loose on it. And we've just been getting more and more involved in that. Um, so in this city, we respond with our paramedics and all our advanced life support stuff. And we have a private ambulance that does our transporting for us. Um, a lot of cities, the fire department just, just runs the whole thing. So there's a whole bunch of different ways to do it. but. Um, yeah, does that yeah. answer that? Thank you. Yeah. So uh, regular medical response, we send one fire engine and one ambulance to. Um, what we're going to show you today is our, our, it's called pit crew CPR. We probably switched over to this uh, in the last four years or so. Uh, we've had great, great results with this. Um, we have an 81% save rate using this pit crew CPR. Um, it, that sounds a little better than it actually is, but this is, this is this is what that means. So if somebody has a cardiac arrest and we get uh, bystander CPR going on them and they're in a shockable rhythm, 81% of those people are walking out of the hospital after that. So I mean, that's a humongous increase in what we've done there. So um, with that being said, to get that program going, we concentrate on getting CPR out there into the community. Um, we got CPR training at the fire department twice, twice a month that anybody can sign up for. So we're encouraging that because that makes a huge Is there difference. A cost for that? Cost yes to get a American Heart Association uh, card. The cost is fifty dollars. 
Um, same information, and we'll give you a Missoula Fire Department CPR card for $25. And we're not making any money on that. That's just to cover our overtime and stuff for people teaching it. So that's been a successful program. So that, that's part of this pit crew CPR thing. The other thing, we've increased our response to cardiac arrest calls. Um, we send two engines now, a battalion chief and the ambulance. So um, we've kind of diagrammed these out because we know they're coming. So we have designed places for everybody to go. So these calls go a lot smoother now. Um, the big focus is on getting adequate compressions. And that's what we're teaching to lay people to, to get at least 100 compressions a minute. We're kind of, we've just uh, done away with teaching lay people like any sort of uh, breathing stuff. People are more likely just to go in and pump on somebody's chest to help them. And that makes a huge difference for us when we get there and for the patient. Um, so with that, any questions? We can watch these guys work. Um, this is gonna be, We'll dispatch you guys just to a witness CPR, uh, CPR in progress by a bystander upon arrival. Are you okay? So you guys, can, you guys can step up here. So Jamie has taken our lead uh, position on this. So she turns on the monitor. She sets this metronome. And it seems kind of weird, but that actually has made a big difference in keeping Farmer doing CPR at the right rate. Um, this mannequin judges Farmer. She's always judging Farmer and his CPR. So right now I can look and see how his CPR is doing. And this has made a big difference around the fire department to improve firefighter CPR. And we can look and see how well he did at the end of all this. And then we can give you guys a chance to try this at the end. So Jamie's running the monitor here. And she'll see if, if he is in a shockable rhythm here. Um, Ari is another paramedic. He's going to work on the airway. I'll show you guys this laryngoscope at the end of this. This thing's pretty awesome. Can you come in after this? I just heard the bass. I got what? Um, is that for intubation? Intubation, okay. yeah. Everyone clear? Shocking. Okay. Compression start again. So Jamie saw that she had a shockable rhythm there, made sure all our people were clear, um, and we get right back on compressions. That's a huge thing, and we're all focused on that. So Ari's got the patient intubated now. So that tube goes directly into your lungs blocks off any secretions from going down there, and now he can breathe for that patient. What level of paramedic can be in the lake? Uh, paramedic. paramedic. Yeah, so the levels are EMT basic, advanced EMT, and then paramedic. We do have airways that, that are basics and our advanced EMTs can put in. Um, they're, pretty, they're pretty good, not as good as this. Um, it's a innovation setup. This is our definitive airway that fixes everything. It's a lane. So this monitor shows us the uh, heart rhythm we got going on, and when it's Ari screws this in, it will tell us how we're doing with our oxy oxygenation. It shows the expelled CO2 from that patient, which helps us. So Skyler, it looks like, has an IV going there. And so our paramedics could have uh, cardiac drugs they can push right now. Epinephrine would be the main one that he'll be going for right now. So they don't have to have a doctor's permission for that type of drug? No, we have standing orders to do pretty much every drug we have. There's a few things we have to call in to the doctors for, but not maybe about three or four things we need to call in for. But Do you have a medical director? We have a medical director, uh, Dr. Krimkoff. St. Patsy's at emergency room doctor over there. 175. Is six people typical for a uh, um, Yeah, this would be one on like person or? Yeah, this would be good. We want, um, so right now when you have a battalion chief there, just documenting what's going on. And then we have our ambulance crew come in and they start kind of preparing for transport. And we have one other person that you're not seeing right now who would be walking around talking to the family, just finding out what's going on. And, you know, just trying to help out. However. 
Do you also have anti or, or a overdose? Yep. Yeah, we carry a uh, Narcan. Yes. Thank yeah. you. So we carry it. All our people can give it. The cops are carrying it now. They can all give it. So yeah, that's been a big push probably in the last year to get that out there with all the opioid overdose problems. When the different, when you have a whatever situation you're getting a call for and you like, you know what you're, maybe you know what you're going into. Does the team kind of have their roles that they like, depending on what it is, or can everybody kind of do? So we rotate to different. Yeah, we basically we want a paramedic like we want Jamie in charge on this, and then she can delegate that out. Some crews they like to get it all set out in the engine, and sometimes you just go in there and see what you find. Uh, one big thing with the CPR is getting people into a space where we can work on them. Like we can't work on somebody in a little tiny bathroom. We got to get them out to a bare room. I think that's good, guys. Save the savior. <laughs> and sometimes you show up and they they be bleeding or they have internal injuries or uh, you know, something else like like broken leg and, and you have other people who would be assigned to those as a ward that you just focus so, on. The so, the the cardiac arrest we run with this complement of people, okay. the two engines, battalion chief and the ambulance, regular run of the mill medical calls, we just send um, one engine and an ambulance. We do have um, bariatrics or bigger patients, over 300 pounds. Our dispatchers are asking about that. So that takes a second engine now for us to help get those people out. Yeah. So that's another time we send extra engines in. So that was good, that was good CPR with you for over 90 percent, so what do we have? 93. Well, that's seven percent with all you. I think you got tired at the end there. It's all cheering. Yeah, how good. So two minutes, we try and we try and rotate our firefighters out, and we found with this machine that that actually is the magic number when we start. Well, you don't, you never say you're tired, of course, but that's when we notice we're like, wait, you are tired. Um. How the equipment? How long does it last, and how often do you rotate for new technology? So let me let me show you this sucker while we're talking about that. So this is our um, new innovation setup. Um, before we had kind of a bright bulb, and you had to like peer down into people's airways. Um, come check this out. All this stuff does expire. Um, probably 10 year lifespan on most of this stuff. So I, I can just put this guy's head back like this. And see, I don't have to put my head down there. We can just all look at this screen. Yeah. So what we're looking for to get a good intubation, that's, that's her vocal cords right there. So we're looking for that. And then we can slide the sure. Then we can slide the tube right down there. So before, um, like without this thing, I would have to be down here looking like this, and it's just a. I mean, you you can still see her vocal cords right there, but you know, much easier with this thing. And then we can we can watch um, we can watch this pass pass through. So we've upped our we've upped our um, innovation success rate to pretty much 100 percent with this wow. from where we used to be. So uh, ten thousand dollars for these suckers, but I mean, really worth it. That 100 percent innovation rate is, I mean, amazing, and it keeps my head out of there. And you also have to understand that when we do innovations, you know. We aren't at waist height on an OR table where we can build them up in the optimal position. You know, this is an emergency that's happened. They could have just had dinner. You know, we have a lot of things that are kind of stacked up against us, and this helps us a lot than just trying to manhandle. I mean, the, you can see the learnoscope. This is what we used to use. Yeah, this is a this is a whole different thing back when we had to use these. And so when you're at an accident scene at 3 a.m. and you know it, that that little ball was what you had. Hmm. So this, this big stuff we try and get through grants, but the problem with the grants is they give you that one-time lump sum, but there's no 
Probably. There's no grants out there written like, hey, yeah, we'll replace your stuff whenever you want. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. So does everybody have the newer one? Every, these are on all our engines, yeah. Um, can I interest anybody in trying some CPR here? Anybody got CPR training? Anybody want to see what they can do? It's been a few years. Well, We've had between zero and ninety something percent. So you can't do it to zero. Did she get zero early? Yeah, we can, <laughs> we can talk you through. Jamie's our star CPR instructor of the fire department. I didn't go that far. <laughs> I, well, I just said that, so. Okay. okay. It's true. All right. Must so, be true. Yeah, it must be true because Dave said it. Yeah. Well, I'll use that on you later. <laughs> so, the, as far as hand placement, just think of mid nipple line. You know, where mid nipple line should be. Um, a, good, a good example or a good location to also think about is kind of where someone's armpits are. That's usually a good nipple line. So, what you want to do is you want to put your hands mid nipple line, and you're going to. I like to say, you know, it's, it's a core workout, you know, use your body weight to your advantage, it's not an upper body workout because you know, you'll, you'll lose energy quickly. I mean, you can see these guys doing it for two minutes, you rotate for a reason. So, hand placement, nipple line, over the top. The one thing you want to do is, so the chest does recoil a little bit, but you want to actually let it come back to full recoil so you actually do allow the heart to refill with blood. So it's down and then back up, down, back up. And so just think about enough like a slide a piece of paper underneath your wrist. You're up. Just start when you're ready. <laughs> and me, me and my machine can help you. I'll give you a little, can I, can I get little, a little sound. You need a metronome here. Yeah, I got a beat here. No, you mm -hmm. sing the Stayin' Alive song. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's what I asked. Oh, yeah? There you go. I don't know if you guys know this when I first started growing up a lot faster. Actually, it's just slow. Yeah. 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 Just take yeah. 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 like yeah. like so your head. Bring that out. Bring that out. There's just, there's, DJ. You literally get your zone. It's a weird thing. Okay. There you go. I actually saved the light in the field across from my house. So you're doing good for getting into those white boxes. You want that. You reach right. On Thanksgiving Day. Oh. We'll just give you a minute, Joe. Um, the fire department came. I so you can see how you get that two minutes as a legit time period for when the quality on this starts to drop. And she was scheduled to have on a defibrillator. Nothing like it. It's kind of worth it. 58%. Every day. Not horrible. Um, so it, it tells us you try to minimize interruptions, and then our rate was off a little bit. You know, all the for us. Yeah. Try to stay in time better. Well, it's, well, it's probably those first compressions sure. you're going way too yeah. slow. Right, right. But I mean, those ones at the end look perfect. To me. Cool. How was so right this is a huge deal for us to get this out in the community and people trained. Yeah. Yeah. It really makes people yeah. savable yeah. for us if people are just I'm doing the best compressions yeah. they can. And they don't have to be perfect. But. So when you don't have the metronome, what's the, the staying alive? But it's like, what do you like? What's, what's like? A, what's another good like? Well, we need something. I don't have we found a new song. Staying alive. Star Wars, the Imperial March. Yeah. Can you sing that? No. One fifteen or what do you? So you just lose a lot of effect. When your heart stops beating, you lose that all the different pump medical things you have going on. So we're just squeezing blood out instead of that pump working together. That's that's why the increased rate. If you had a, a wish list of whatever you want to bring, what would be something that you don't have now and you really would like, you think might help everything. Or maybe something you do have now but you need more of. Are you talking about just related to medical stuff or are you talking about for fire in general? Well, since medical is 76%, yes. How about just for your medical? Just for medical. More I would, I want uh, replacements on our laryngoscopes probably is the next big money thing. Um, we also, we have modems on these things that we need to get replaced probably in the next year, um, and they're about $1,500 per light pack, and that allows us to trans transmit whatever's going on in the field to the hospital, so those two items. 
probably. So would that be something that you would have to get a grant for, or could you go to the city council for, or the Brazilian taxpayers? How do you do you try to fund that? I, I would fund um, definitely the laryngoscopes through a grant, and this, I'm not sure, grant possibly. How is the response been from the city council and Missoula citizens to your requests? Are we keeping up with what you need? Yeah. Yeah, it's been great. Really? Yep. Okay. Yep. Treated the fire department very well. Thank Anybody you. else want to try CPR? <laughs> Good. Well, thanks for coming, guys. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Show us how it's done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I walked away from that program thinking, no, they are our first line of social workers. And, and so I think both of these gentlemen have, have really spoken to that, that we have a social problem first and foremost, <coughs> and, and we do the very best that we possibly can with the limited resources. I think we've got some good answers to that, and I, we're, we're going to be enacting those. I'm excited for some things, and I can speak more later on on that. But. Yep. Do you have a threshold of when to call 911? Because sometimes, sometimes there's things that are happening, and you're like, I think we need somebody to maybe come over here, but it's not an emergency. So is there a way to differentiate that for the public? Is this law enforcement or medical? So typically what I've done is I've called Missoula the non-emergency police line, uh -huh. and then I just get transferred to 911. So apparently it was a 911 call, but it would not be something that I would think would be a threshold of a 911 call. Um, Basically, if you need officer advice or an officer response, it needs to go to the one. If you want to report an incident that maybe your bike was stolen or your car was broken into and it's no longer in progress, that can be done through the non-emergency line. I would try to push a little bit of just common sense. We get, we get phone calls of the person that drives by on the road and they see a person on the side of the road and they call 911. Hey, I just drove by a guy laying on the sidewalk. I don't know why you're doing that. Like, that guy's probably just taking a nap. Honestly, I mean, I'm just, I want to be completely transparent. You know, if you want to, if you want to stop and then get out and give a little nudge or say, hey, can I help you? And take that amount of effort, I'll take that all day. But to drive by, uh, hey, I smelled smoke. This, this Reserve Street Bridge with our, some of our clientele that are living in that area, uh, we get calls of, Hey, I just drove over the Reserve, Reserve Street Bridge and I smell smoke. Can't not go. Yeah, and, and, and that's all right. Call and, and we'll go. But starting here, like, if, if you're concerned, then, then stop and, and take a look um, and, and just let that in. But not on the Reserve Street Bridge. Where do you get the point? See, he's traffic control. I didn't know. Uh, <laughs> And I don't really know what to ask, but um, basically, um, I know there's an increase in meth, and um, it sounds like heroin as well in Missoula. And um, what is the police department doing about that? And what can citizens do? I guess I just need information. Uh, since 2011, violent crime in Missoula has increased about 49%. Mm -hmm. And drug crimes in the last three to four years um, charged, charged crimes with the county attorney for meth have gone up about 300%. So um, the police department is seeing um, our violent crime is clearly tied to drug use. Um, and we've had some horrific crimes in the, in the last couple of years. We are currently working in um, as of about six months ago, started a, a Project Safe Neighborhoods program working with um, the U.S. Attorney's Office, the local prosecutor, and all the law enforcement people related here in Missoula to try and address um, some of those increases in crime. 2017, we saw a slight drop, so we didn't continue to see that rise in violent crime, but we are focusing through the, the combined drug task force that we have, as well as the Project Safe Neighborhoods program. Larry. 
I'm curious about the uh, training and qualifications of the people that answer the phone at the police department, not 911. I had occasion recently because a neighbor BB gun broke a window in the back of my house to ask for an officer to come. I could not talk that person who answered the phone into the fact that it was not a 911 call, I just needed an officer. He put me on hold and sent me to 911. Because they don't dispatch officers. 911 dispatches all fire, ambulance, and law enforcement from Missoula County. So it had to go to 911. Correct. Our people at the 24 hour desk cannot dispatch officers. I'm curious if you could each share maybe one of your like favorite things about working with the city of Missoula specifically, and then maybe if you have a frustration um, that you wish the city could step up and address for you. <laughs> for the city of Missoula? Well, certainly was fortunate. I don't know how, and, and, I, and I've been able to, I've, I've been in an administrative position for the last seven years now, and it's, it's afforded me the, the ability to view and firsthand all of our new folks coming through. And quite frankly, I have no idea why these people chose me to work here. We have such qualified individuals coming into, into this workforce, smarter, brighter, quicker thinking, that are scared of nothing, scared of no technology. You know, and and uh, and so that is, it's so invigorating. And every time, every year, we talk a little bit about uh, our candidates that are coming in and that recruitment. But that revitalization, and, and all of us say that. And there's a pretty good, there's six to eight people on our interview panels, and every year it's the same thing. It's like, well, we're so blessed to work in a place like the Missoula Fire Department, but. Uh, you know, just, just the caliber of folks that are wanting to come through this door and come to this city and work is, is inspiring. And, and I, I come out of there revitalized every time. And like, I need to pick up my game. I gotta, I gotta get some of these projects done, that sort of thing. Um, as far as a need or uh, something that, that would change, you know, th there's not this big, huge thing. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, we have 95 folks on our in our fire department that, uh, and, and we have, have a great management team uh, of about uh, nine folks that uh, that we meet monthly and make those decisions, and and that is we're challenged with we're challenged with our budgets, we're challenged with our workload, we're challenged with that time management, and trying to provide what you expect when you pick up the phone and call 911. In the fire department, we come and we solve problems. And we have access between us and law enforcement. We can get a we can get a dump truck there, I can get a garbage truck there, I can get a bulldozer there, we can get a crane there, we can pick a car out of the river. We can do that's what we do is we take care of problems. And and we take that we take that charge very seriously to be able to come to your house, mitigate your problem, make it safe, stabilize that incident. And then, and then go go to our next call that needs to happen. Is we're running about 27, 28 calls a day, and and we take that charge very seriously. And and having that ability, Missoula has been very supportive with us. Uh, we're, we're, as we're always pushing the needle, that's that's our type A attitude, uh, leaning forward, making change, being better, and and meeting, and trying to keep our 95 folks, all of us motivated, but meeting those needs that you're looking to us every single day to provide. And we can, we will do that um, every single day. And we continue to do that going forward. Chief Ray? Um, it's along the same lines. It's it's the, the people that want to come to Missoula because of what Missoula has to offer. And that's the quality of life. And we spend a lot of time as police officers addressing your quality of life concerns. It may not be a law being broken, they may not be a criminal incident, but it's something that matters to you. It's your neighbor that is doing something that bothers you. We are still a department that takes the time to come and talk to you and help you work through those things. And we're hiring a lot of young people that are very well educated. They clearly know that this is what they want to do. 
and they're willing to take the time. They're, you know, we, we've focused a lot on how we handle critical incidents, people in crisis. And police and fire do that every single day, more than they do anything else. And what is very gratifying to me is seeing the change from 30 years ago when we didn't take that extra minute or two with that person who really needed the time. They just needed to vent. And we have police officers that will now take the time to listen. And they'll take the time to look for alternatives. And while services are hard to come by and options are limited, we still have officers that go out of their way to take the time to listen and make the right choices. And that's what's going Frustrations, like all of you, it's your budgets, it's our budgets. It costs more every year to provide that same level of service, and we're gonna do it, and we're gonna do it with what we have if we don't get more, but we're gonna continue to do it. Do you think if uh, Missoula stepped up and provided what housing it would lift your budgets? repeat the question. If Missoula, if the city stepped up and provided wet housing, which is being discussed quite a bit, and, yeah. So wet, wet housing is what she's talking about, is, is a drug tank, basically. And we've had, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Go ahead. No, go ahead. So the only module that I've seen that worked for a little bit, and that was from grant funding that I know of, was Billings. And that operated for several years and then funding kind of ran out and they did that but that was a place our, our neighbors to the west is spokane and they have a different venue of that but similar to that where they figure out a facility they have uh, basic emts if you will or people to check on things and you can try to alleviate some of those really the relief of the hospital is that, is that correct? So, yeah, so more on the hospital end than it is on your end? Yes, yes, because as we as we go out and law enforcement typically is on scene uh, pretty quick as they're running all around town doing their work uh, and, our, and our crew and one of our fire engines show up, you know, there needs to be some kind of assessment made, the ability to see if that person is transport. The basic thing is airway, correct? We need to make sure if that person's breathing or not and then Try to try to figure that out for transportation and that. I, was, I will speak real quick to. I think that, unfortunately, I believe community paramedicine, you know, the community. Is that what it was called? Community. They. I mean. So, uh, community paramedicine bill, community bill. It, it, it died in committee this last week, and that had that ability. Uh, I thought would be a great stepping stone for the ability for healthcare providers to provide augment of uh, maybe law enforcement and fire but being able to yes mrs smith with education yes mrs smith we will have someone there in a half an hour 45 minutes to, to speak with you and and seeing some of that relief and i think that's where we need to go we did we don't necessarily need that legislation it would have helped but to to put to stand that kind of program up is going to take some big community involvement and i i, I believe we're there i believe that that our infrastructure is stressed enough, uh, the capabilities and the cost of Medicaid, Medicare, and those facilities. I think we're, I think we're really compressing that time frame of it, of showing that need, and realistically trying to put something in place for Missoula. I think we see it something like that for years. I'm excited. If, I think we can put something together. I would. It's on my one of my to do list. Okay. Alex, did you have a question? I have one more question. How do you interact with the um, volunteer fire departments? So like, you know, the Clinton or the Bonner, you know, that have the volunteer fire departments? Yeah, day to day we, we have mutual aid and auto aid agreements around the area. And uh, Missoula Rule has a lot more of those, Missoula Rule Fire Department. But we have auto mutual aid and auto aid agreements with them. And we in in our administrative level have meetings once a month every bi-monthly to talk about what's going on in emergency services they're involved in the 911 advisory committee that we have also the lapc which is local emergency provider committee 
and <laughs> attack and go to the front and and so that that is, that's railroad, that's hospitals, that that's uh, all of those entities, and those meet quarterly, and so. We were meeting regularly to try to help provide that service, not just for Missoula City, but holistically that we could support. As our, as our equipment, and we get new equipment, and we're fortunate enough for our grant, we take, we, get, we, we are able to surplus radios out to superiors for those folks. <coughs> those radios that you see on our belts are about 2,500 apiece. And so those smaller towns can't do that. And as we sunset those, or we get a grant for successful in grant writing, and we get that pushed, then we all of a sudden we have 15 uh, surplus radios that are still programmable, that still have a lot of use. Potomac, Sealy Lake, we give bunkers to those and, and help our neighbors out. And we continue to lean forward into that. And it helps with good communication uh, throughout the valley. Thank you. Yes, sir. How much do you rely on? Well, we don't rely on them, that's for sure, but uh, uh, we apply for them every year, and it is, we're, sometimes we're successful, there's a few years that are su successful, and there's some years that aren't, um, and it's a moving target because those are usually separated out, I can't speak to law enforcement, but with the fire, with the fire, with the fire grants, uh, that's a moving target because they'll put priorities um, sometimes it's safer grant and manual. We went through the we went through the recession in 2007-2009. Detroit and all those cities that you saw just were dumping. They didn't have they didn't have that income. So uh, let me tell you, when, when budgets are hurting, the two Chief Brady's department and my department make up over half, almost half of of the employees of, of the. City Missoula. Yeah. Yeah. We're the first ones that they kind of take a look at because our salaries and they start browning out what we call brown out station fire stations, which they they would take a station, not man it for the day shift or 24 hours, mm -hmm. or they start putting things on furlough as we've seen right in the news, and they start making those hard choices and not covering those areas of risk versus benefit, risk versus, versus cost analysis to be able to do that. Those are tough decisions. But sometimes in that priority, sorry, I just like wait a little bit. In that priority, they took safer grants for police and fire, and they gave those grants to those larger cities and throughout as that, that tree filter of the ability in, to grab those grants, put police, put fire back on the streets uh, in a timely manner. Sometimes with matching, sometimes no, not matching, but you had to apply for that. Did you want to yeah, that? we have we have no um, um, salaries funded under grants at this point. We have had some cops grants in the past. The problem with those is they're sometimes 25 percent of the wage for three years, and then you got to fully fund them by the fourth year. They help you boost your staffing. We do have some equipment grants through uh, what are called uh, justice assistance grants. So some of our body worn, our tasers, and some other equipment that um, if we don't get that grant next year, we aren't having to lay someone off. So we, we consistently try to, to maintain some equipment with grants, but we haven't been seeking um, those. A lot of the COPS grants are now going to the Indian country, so they're not necessarily available. And I think along those grants too, um, you don't know this, but I asked Scott Hoffman to, to look into this and Jeff. Um, to look back at the last 10 years and find out how much we actually have been able to receive in grants compared to having to ask cat go to the taxpayer to, to get that benefit. So that's the 10 year timeline. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think the other thing I, I think is really critical is that I would like you to talk about is there was a period of time where I think most people didn't understand what it takes to train an officer, and we were losing our officers. Can you talk to that a little bit? So, our officers, when they go out to Helena for their training, there are some communities that don't do that. Well, and it's a very different thing, and I think this is a very important distinction and will benefit to you as a Missoulian. So, when, when you're hired as a police officer in Missoula, you don't do anything but orientation until after you receive the basic academy. Some 
smaller departments and now some larger departments around the state will put a person to work with another officer and they'll work there for up to 12 months to 18 months before they even go to the basic academy. So smaller communities, it's really difficult for them to get spots in the academy and it's also hard for us to get spots in the academy, but we will not put anybody on the street or even if in our training program until they've been through the basic academy. How often does the happen? And that's another issue is the state, we are required to go to the state academy here in Montana if they don't come from another state certified. It's offered three times a year, January, April, and September. We only get three spots in each one and we have to go on waiting lists. The last waiting list we were on, we were number 50, 51, 52. I mean, it's, there's so many more people trying to get into these academies than the state has room for. So it's a, it's a constant thing. Our retention in Missoula, um, our attrition, um, Bozeman did a study. Bozeman is having a, a lot harder time than we are. Um, cost of housing and other things in Bozeman is making it even more difficult. But our average is um, right around four, four and a half officers per year. Bozeman's right around 15. So there's, there's a huge amount of time and effort that goes into recruitment and getting people hired and then having a spot for them in the academy. So there is hardly a department in this state that isn't running with vacancies. Yes. Where do those folks go? Are they like leaving the state to go to other other cities? Did well, we actually recruit from other departments. Um, we're doing interviews in a week, and all all of them are currently employed in other state departments. Um, Missoula pays near the top of the wage list for the state. The they want to live here. Missoula is place where people, young people love this life. They, they really do. Just young um, people? <laughs> <laughs> so the Missoula community and what it has to offer is a great um, tool for us to use to recruit. Because it, it has a lifestyle that they're looking for. Just like a lot of other people are. But um, it, it um, we are fortunate now that we have people wanting to come to the Zoom room. And I'll just tag on that. There was something that I learned that at one point Mayor Ingen um, was facing this uh, this problem of losing uh, losing police officers. That it takes so much effort to actually hire somebody and then train them and then retain them. And because we weren't paying enough at that time, we lost them. And so. He basically made a plea to the city council back in that day said, and basically said, we have to do the right thing by these, these officers. We have to bring them up to the parity of our, our fire staff because if we don't, we're going to keep having this problem. And as you saw, all those calls for service keep escalating. It's only going to get worse. And that quality of life that we so treasure dissipates. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Well, it's 9.30. Do we have maybe one more question? I'm here all night. I'll stay and talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm talking about our fire department. I'm, I'm here. So if you guys want to stay after, but any, any other questions? He's kicking me out. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right.